Okay, uh, good morning everyone and welcome to the 17th meeting of the Local Government and Communities Committee in 2017. Can I remind everyone present to turn off mobile phones and as meeting papers are provided in digital format, tablets may be used by members during the meeting. We've got one apology this evening, eh, this evening, this morning, try that again. Eh, Kenneth Gibson, MSP, will not be with us this morning and we move to agenda item one, which is the decision to take business in private. Can I invite the committee to agree whether to take item five, consideration of a draft letter to local authorities regarding their strategic housing investment plans in private. Are we agreed? Okay, thank members for that. And we move to agenda item two, which is local government in Scotland performance and challenges 2017. Uh, and the committee will take evidence from the Accounts Commission on its 2017 report on the performance of local authorities. So can I welcome Ronnie Hines, the Acting Chair, uh, Fraser McKinley, Director of Performance Audit and Best Value, and Mark McCabe, Senior Manager, Performance Audit and Best Value, Accounts Commission. Uh, thank you all of you for coming along here this morning. It's appreciated. And can I invite Ronnie Hines to make any opening rem remarks that Mr Hines would wish to make? Thank you, Convener. Um, I'd like to start just by expressing our appreciation for the opportunity uh, we had, I think, a productive engagement some months ago when we looked at the sister report to the one that we're here to consider this morning, the financial overview, and I hope that was true on uh, your side of the table as much as on ours. So we welcome the opportunity to come along today and talk about this particular report. Um, the fact that there are two reports is probably a significant point to make in itself. You'll be aware that a previous practice has been to cover quite a lot of ground in a single overview report on local government each year. We felt a year ago that trying to split those down would be more helpful and we're still casting around in our minds whether in fact that was the better thing to do. So I'd certainly be interested in any feedback from the committee in that regard. In addition to that, perhaps only three points that I'd want to highlight from the report. It covers still quite a lot of ground and I'm sure there'll be questions from a range of perspectives. But the three that I'd perhaps want to highlight would be, first, that because we have split them, there's more opportunity in this report to get into a more substantial analysis of some of the aspects of performance in local government than we were able to do previously. And you can see sections in the report where we're delving into that in a bit more detail to do with comparative performance between councils, unit costs, and so on. So that would be one point to highlight for me. Um, a second would be that um, we're beginning to detect perhaps a bit of a trend in relation to the decisions that are made in local government in the light of the spending pressures that they're under. And that would be that the degree of protection that's been understandably afforded to the, the two key services or the two bigger services, I should probably say, education and social work, does have consequences for the relatively non-protected services. And that's an issue that we've got a growing interest in. And we touch on that in this report. So that's probably worth highlighting as well, I think. And the third and final point that for me is related to that is that the Commission has deliberated quite hard and listened carefully to local government and others about the stance that we take in relation to the duty of best value and the requirement for con continuous improvement that underpins that. And we've, we, we've responded to the critique of the question, which is how realistic is that expectation in the light of an ongoing reduction over a long period of time in the resources that are available to local governments? So you'll see in the report that what we're saying is what we want to see is that there are clear priorities set by councils, that they align their plans their strategies, their workforce, their resources behind that, and that they give a clear account of how they've reached those decisions to themselves, obviously, but also to the people who live in those areas. And that's an acknowledgement that perhaps to simply insist on continuous improvement for every service all the time um, is too demanding an ask at this point in time. And again, we'd be interested in the committee's views on that. So I think those are the three things that I would highlight. But as I say, it's a wide-ranging report. I'm sure that members will have questions from a range of perspectives. We'll do our best to answer them. That's very helpful, Mr Hines. Uh, thank you very much. I'm, I'm conscious that this is a different way of doing things. So we've had a cut at, at the numbers underlying uh, strategic performance. We've got the financial overview has been there. This is very much about how local authorities are managing uh, the financial position going forward in a strategic way. Um, you do know real terms cuts to local authorities uh, in terms of, of the revenue uh, grant, but you also mentioned in your opening statement there uh, social work uh, and education. One of the things this committee has been, been, been quite keen to look at is the overall spending power of local authorities uh, not just the revenue grant, but other areas. So, for example, you, you mentioned social work, and, of course, there's now the integrated 
joint boards. Um, so, for example, when we were doing our budget scrutiny, uh, Councillor McAfee, the former uh, leader of Glasgow City Council, uh, noted £33 million that was going to Glasgow City Council to ease pressures on social work uh, services. That wouldn't feature in the revenue grant. And obviously, there's been lots of publicity in relation to education and attainment challenge and attainment funds. And the figure £120 million is used in relation to that. And again, that's not mentioned that that doesn't feature in the, the, the revenue grant support, but the government often quotes these figures and gives a different set of numbers. So when you talk about protected services in terms of social work and education, are you referring to to these types of monies that I'm mentioning, or are you talking about ring fence monies separate from that in local authority settlements? And in that context, could you give us a better understanding of when we're looking at, at real terms cuts are we talking about, um, I don't want to play the numbers game, but I want to get a context to it. Are we talking real terms cuts in terms of the overall totality of the spend of local authorities? Or are we talking specifically about the revenue grant? And how do you distinguish between those when looking at local authority performance? Okay, well, I'll ask Fraser and Mark to respond on the specifics of the uh, different funds that you've referred to. My opening remarks were intended to be all-embracing, so I'm talking about yeah. the totality of funding that's available. And when I talk about protection, relative protection, for education and social services in particular, um, it's a reflection of the fact that these are high-priority services. There are clear policy priorities that the Scottish Government and local government share in relation to them. So over and above any protected funding streams, there will be a sense that when it comes to budget decisions, um, anything that can be spared in terms of not asking for savings or cuts in those services will tend to be a priority for most councils, and the consequence of that will be that other services will bear the brunt of it. That was the thrust of that remark. In relation to the funding streams, Sarah Fraser remark can give us yeah. more information. Thanks, Convener. I'm happy to, to pick that up. So we had a good discussion about this when we were here last time round, and I think the work of the committee through the Budget Review Group and then on the back of your report, I think the Cabinet Secretary has said that they will try and bring more clarity and transparency to this whole uh, area uh, this time round for the next budget cycle, which I think will be enormously helpful. I think that will make a big difference. I mean, our starting point is is a reasonably straightforward one, which is we can follow the money in terms of which budget line does it go into. That's our starting point. And as you know, the, the integration money uh, in officially, in technical terms, goes into the health budget, so we don't include it uh, in, uh, specifically in, in here. Um, exhibit 2 in the report uh, covers all the different bits of funding and the notes explain how we've got to that position. We are absolutely aware, though, that there is other money in the system. We talked about City Deal uh, money last time we were here as well, and uh, being an increasingly important uh, uh, part of the uh, of the jigsaw. Um, similarly, uh, service charges and, and income from other places and an increasing appetite and interest for what councils would call a more commercial approach to generating income. So there's absolutely no doubt that the complexity of the financing landscape in local government is moving on a pace. We need to keep pace with that. Just very briefly, uh, convener, on, on for our part, you'll remember last time round that we committed to the committee to, to see what we could do at our end to try and uh, make more consistent with some other uh, bodies and some other colleagues how we report on this. And we've, the team have done some really good work with the Parliament's uh, Financial Scrutiny Unit in SPICE to the point that we now have a shared approach, a shared methodology, if you like, for particularly the, the time series reporting. And um, you'll remember there was a, there's been some discussion about how we account for police and fire and that. We've now reached a position with SPICE colleagues that, that we're using the same approach. So, so hopefully, at least between us and, if you like, as the kind of independent commentators, we're trying to get to a place of at least we're presenting on the same, the same basis. So, so I think with your work and our work, we're heading in the right direction to try and get better transparency and more clarity about how all this works. That, that's very helpful and it, it puts a context to, to, to these discussions, but irrespective of the numbers, they're obviously challenging situations for local authorities out there and we want to to, to, to look at how they're managing some of that and we'll now, we'll now move on in relation to that. Uh, can I bring in Elaine Smith, MSP? Thanks, convener. Good morning, panel. Uh, yeah, I wonder if you could perhaps just outline for us um, some of the, the barriers that councils are facing when it comes to adapting to the challenging circumstances that the convener mentioned? Well, thank you, yes. I'll, I'll kick off. Some of it is mentioned in the report. Um, 
the complexity of the environment in which councils are having to work clearly constitutes a challenge in relation to the performance and their core duty to deliver services and deliver them to best value. We set that out in some respects in Exhibit 5 in the report. Um, it could easily be read as a series of excuses, and I hope it doesn't read that way, because that's not the intention. But I think we have to be fair, honest and realistic when we're looking at what councils are being asked to do. And that set of challenges, I think, the legislative and policy changes and the various other things that they have to contend with, that would be part of it. The, the response to some of those, I think, um, or perhaps a key response, is to work in partnership with other bodies, and that's something that we've always taken an interest in. In fact, we're taking an increasing interest in going forward. That itself brings challenges. Um, it's not because we think local councils are insular and don't want to work in partnership, far from it. Um, but working in partnership is a different modus operandi compared to being responsible for things at your own hand. And some of the challenges that you face become bigger because the organisations with which you're working in partnership have their own challenges and their own priorities, and they won't always coincide with yours. So that would be my first take uh, and answer to the question. The environment is complex, and dealing with it is not easy either. Could I stop you just there for a further question? Is that then what you mean when you say evaluate options for change in service redesign, including options for investing to save? It sounds a bit strange to talk about investing to save in the current climate when actually um, it, there's cuts to budgets. Uh, no, that's not what I meant, but I think it's a fair point to make in relation to the first question. So investing to save would, for me, partly mean that you've got capital and revenue expenditure. If you've got scope in your capital budget, and councils quite often do, then it would be wise in the current climate to be prioritising projects or programmes that are likely to deliver reduced running costs going forward. And we see quite a lot of evidence that that does happen. So that's mainly the kind of thing we mean when we talk about Invest to Save. OK, thanks. Um, and if you do you want to add anything else on the, the, the first part of the question that asked about the barriers? Not in my own account, but perhaps the others. Mark? Um, well, councils are certainly facing challenges from all the demographic change that we've, we've outlined in the report. Um, and that's got you know particular implications for its its big services in terms of social work and um, education. So balancing that alongside all the the demands in terms of the legislative and policy changes um, are things that the council needs to weigh up alongside um, all its local priorities as well. So you know in a, as um, as Ronnie said, it's a it's a really complex picture. And I think if I might convene or carry yes, on with this, yes. much of the work that councils do, uh, and I should say I was employed for 10 years in local government, but much of the work that they do um, is, is carried out by staff, by people that, that it's a service sector, if you want to call it that. So in your report in Exhibit 6, you say that um, in 2011 there was 213, two, sorry, 213,200, so 213,200 employees, but by 2016, that's down to 198,100. So I suppose when we look at that, and, and we also look at um, the, the increasing amount of funding that is being uh, ring-fenced or reserved, if you like, for spending on education and social work, the question then arises whether or not um, the increases in council tax that are now allowable and the perhaps the increasing fees for services is all of that going to be sustainable in the longer run, in the longer term? Uh, well, we make the point in the report that even if councils were to take full advantage of the freedom they now have to raise council tax without any grant penalty, it wouldn't make a huge difference in any given year to the total funding available to them. But we also say, and I think it's related to Exhibit 6, which was mentioned in, in your question, we also say that um, we've been... Um, criticising councils for some time now that in the light of the challenges they face and the reductions they're having to make in their budget um, and because so much of their budget is staff costs they have been reducing their workforce but we don't always see a good workforce plan to go with that and we give an example in the report which is a material illustration of why we say that because when you do reach a stage when you're asking yourself can you do things differently can you take on um, a different approach to how the work could be done you need to have the skills to do that. And there are, there are now instances coming up, not just in the overview report, but in our best value <coughs> reports, where we see that councils are struggling to do that because they've let go a lot of expertise that they now could quite happily use. So a strategy at an earlier stage, it's easy with hindsight, I recognise that, but a strategy that tried to recognise 
over the foreseeable future, the skills that you might need to retain in order to respond to the challenges that you're only going to face is exactly what we think Council should be doing. But do you think uh, this is, uh, in the long term, we've got growing demand for services, we look at the demographics of the population, we've got increasing cuts to staff, etc. Uh, you know, is this sustainable? Is, is local government is sustainable? Is increasing cuts, or are we going to have to start looking at whether or not um, more investment has to go into local government? Well, one of the points that we also make in the report is that um, a reduction in resources doesn't have to coincide with a reduction in the quality or the level of service. Um, so there is still scope for basic things like good management, service reviews and so on, and also for bigger approaches to this, like transforming the way services are delivered. So I think we're nowhere near the stage where we're able to say that there's a question about sustainability in terms of local government services. OK, thanks. OK, thank you, Lane Smith. Uh, Graham Simpson. Thanks very much. Um, it was really to uh, follow on from the uh, staffing angle. Um, I was very interested to read in the report the wide variation of sickness absences in, in councils. And just for the record, if I can just read out some of the figures. Um, we, we have, uh, for, for example, an average of 8.8 uh, .8 days uh, a year off sick in Aberdeenshire to 14.8 days a year uh, in the Western Isles. Uh, and if you just take um, uh, teachers, uh, 4.2 days in Midlothian to 8.7 days uh, in Perth and Kinross. Um, so, in, you know, in some councils, you, you're talking about the, uh, the equivalent of uh, over two, two weeks off sick on average uh, a year, which is quite, which is, a, a lot, an awful lot. Um, so what are the best councils doing that the, the worst councils aren't? Because clearly if uh, the worst councils could meet the, the sort of uh, performance of the best, uh, that would save an awful lot of money uh, and potentially improve services. Well, I can make a start and then I'll ask Fraser to come in on that. Um, one of the things I said in my, op my opening remarks is that we're delving a bit deeper into these comparative analyses. We did actually look at that particular issue in last year's report as well. Um, that was dipping our toe in the water, if you like. The reason we chose that example, just to put it in that wider context, is because it's relatively free from some of the complexity. If you try to look at comparative performance in other areas, like, say, educational attainment, you can't ignore some of the socio-economic factors that clearly have an impact there. When it comes to managing staff absence, that's relatively irrelevant. It really is a management issue by and large. So we picked that because it's less controversial. And if you like, floats the idea that this publicity of these variances is itself a stimulus to improvement, which is what we're trying to do here. Now, to answer the question directly, we don't have a good answer to um, why it is that in some areas they're better at this than others. I'm pretty sure that if we looked at it over time, we'd find that that has changed, that some councils that used to have bigger levels or higher levels of staff absence now have lower ones. And I would like to think, but we can't demonstrate that just yet, that that's because they themselves are working collaboratively with each other in family groups and saying, why is it that your level of sickness absence is so much lower than ours? What are you doing that we're not doing? And we think as a commission, that's an important role for us to play to encourage that kind of framework, that kind of engagement between councils. It's their responsibility to manage sickness absence and not ours. So our contribution here is to publicise how they're doing and the disparities between them. I, I can say a little bit con more convenient about the, the kinds of things that we see in the councils that are that are doing it well. So Ronnie's absolutely right. I think the starting point is having good data, so understanding um, what your levels of sickness are, the nature of that sickness absence. Is it does it tend to be stress related? Is it um, you know uh, different kinds of uh, absence? Um, knowing who those people are in particular, is it long term sick? Is it short term sick? So understanding the nature of the problem is absolutely key. First of all. Beyond that, then, um, in the places that we've seen it uh, reduce, as Ronnie's just described, it is, it's partly a question of focus. So it's partly about really focusing on the issue, ensuring that the reporting mechanisms are right, ensuring that the monitoring is there, ensuring that the support is in place to get people back into work appropriately um, uh, as quickly as, as, as you possibly can. The, 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 it tends to be that the, the longer people are off work, the harder it is to get them back to work, if you know what I mean. So, um, and, and then more broadly, if you look at what's happening in, in the world of 
HR and organisation development, a much stronger focus on well-being of uh, of staff and of your people rather than just dealing it as a sickness absence issue. So taking a wider approach to colleagues' well-being is, is where the agenda is now at. So those are the kinds of things that we can see the Better Council is doing. And as, uh, and as the Chair said, um, having those conversations between the best councils and the ones that need to improve is absolutely the starting point. Okay. Um, so I really don't think it's your job to sort of drill down further and, and see what exactly the, the best councils are doing. I mean, I was, I was very struck by this figure. If, um, you know, if, we, if, if all councils uh, met the, the kind of best performing figure, that would be the equivalent of 650 full-time employees across Scotland. Or committee members, could you point at which part? Oh, of the I'm very sorry. So at? it's um, on page uh, 20 uh, in your report, and it's paragraph 31 and 32. It's very helpful. Thanks. Okay. Um, so 650 full-time uh, employees, and if you just take teachers, uh, 160 full-time teachers. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I was a, I was a councillor for for ten years, and I was continually banging on about this, and saw very little improvement in the council where where I was. Um, do Do you think it's just enough just to highlight the differences, or should we be doing more? Uh, well, I hope I didn't say that. Didn't think it was our responsibility to drill any further. Um, one of the questions that I posed at the beginning was where we might take this kind of analysis in the future, and I'd be interested in the committee's views on that. Um, but what I did say is that it's primarily the responsibility of the councils. They're the employing organisations. They're the ones with the policies, the practices at their disposal. So you have to ask, what contribution can you best make? My view is that, as a commission, um, it's a useful contribution to publicise this kind of performance, particularly in those relative or comparative terms, because I know that if you're on the other side of that within a council and you're one of the ones who doesn't look terribly good in this regard or some other, that it's going to be some stimulus to do something about it. So publicity does help in that regard. But beyond that, if we identify good practice, as Fraser <coughs> described, then we will highlight that. We don't have an example of stick, uh, sickness management absence in this report, but we do have other examples where councils have good practice. So if we find good practice, we will certainly make it our business to illuminate that. And that would apply to sickness absence as much as anything else. OK. OK, uh, thanks, Mr Simpson. Can I just check in relation to, to, staff, to staff absence? I hear anecdotally about various departments in Glasgow City Council and various levels of, of staff absence. I'm sure it's the same across local authorities. You distinguish between teaching and non-teaching within, within the Council Commission. But if one local authority has a pretty high level of staff absence in one department, does that not suggest there's something amiss in terms of how they've invested in it or a management culture? Or does it not really suggest there's something there that needs to be to be actioned, a step has to be taken? And w would you ever flag up to specific local authorities that are uh, outliers, if you like, that they really have to have a close look at this? Mark might want to come in and say a bit more, um, because I think that takes us into the level of audits of individual councils. My opening comment would be to agree with that. Um, one of the things that we're doing at a strategic level within the Commission is, in our new approach to best value, um, having a closer alignment between the periodic, um, every five years or so, um, exercise in a council of looking for best value in accordance with the statute. On the one hand, and on the other hand, the annual audit that takes place every year. So because of that, we'll be in a stronger position if we discover the kind of issue that you've just described within an individual council to flag that up, not just in the annual audit report, but um, within the best value report that council will receive as well. So you wouldn't, I wouldn't expect us to be covering that in a report like this. It's covering all 32 councils in Scotland. But when we get into, in that case, <coughs> Glasgow City Council, if that were apparent to us, then I would expect to see that mentioned in the audit report. I should, should point out, um, before Mr. Mc, uh, Mr McCabe comes in, that I'm not targeting Glasgow City Council. I merely make the point here anecdotally about varying levels of, of, of absence in, v in various departments. And you, ha you have to then cross over and go, well, does, does that tell you something about how 
one department needs improved in relation to the other one and should that flag something in the management systems of any local authority, not just Glasgow, to take appropriate steps to investigate and scrutinise that? Sorry, Mr McCabe. Um, as, as Ronnie said, the, the data that's available nationally doesn't get broken down by the departments. So we only have it at a council level and it's, it's by um, teachers and then other employees. So it, it's difficult to take forward and, and investigate some of those anecdotal things. As Ronnie said, um, we would be assuring ourselves when we looked at individual councils as part of our best value audits that councils actually understood where the absences were. Um, I guess what we what we hear anecdotally ourselves is that departments like social work um, is where there's a lot of pressure and, and that's where um, absence tends to be higher. Um, and I think that's a problem across all councils. But um, a big part um, of our best value audit is actually seeing that councils understand where the sickness absence is, assuring themselves that they have the best practices in pl place, are comparing what they do with others. Um, and you know these national figures. I mean, what they what they don't highlight is you know where some of those councils may have outsourced services. Um, so you know you're not necessarily always comparing like with like because if councils deliver more services in house, then there's a higher risk that they'll have a, a higher absence level compared to those that contract services out. Okay, well, that's helpful. Thank you, uh, Mr. Whiteman. Uh, thank you, <coughs> uh, convener. I just wonder um, from your work. Uh, what impression you have of the extent to which local authorities are learning from each other about their performance in light of your work, of course, uh, the reports you produce, but also in light of the, the services that are available to them, for example, the improvement service? Uh, well, I, my general impression is that they are learning. I mean, you, would, you would hope and expect that's the case, given the pressures under which they're operating. I can point to things like the benchmarking framework, which is referred to in the report. That's a collective enterprise run by local councils for their own benefit, um, in which we take a very keen interest as a commission, not least because we've, in effect, um, devolved the responsibility to councils to come up with the indicators or measures by which their effectiveness will be measured. Um, we've got a statutory duty to report on that, but we think it's better if they come up with the measures that are meaningful rather than us. So we've got a key stake in that particular game, and we, uh, we take an interest in what they're doing. On the basis of what I know from that, I know that that's a very vibrant context in which that kind of learning takes place. I also know that they make increasing use of the improvement service. Um, there will be some common or generic themes that pretty much every council will uh, ask the improvement service to um, help them with. There will be some others that are particular to the council itself. And one of the stimuli for that can be a critical report from the Accounts Commission. And we do see a fair bit of evidence of that. Um, one of the things that we try to do when we've issued a report, good, bad or, or otherwise, is to meet with the council itself, with the political and the management leadership, and to have an honest conversation and confidence about what they're going to do in response to that report and how they feel about the way that the, the, the audit was conducted. And pretty much all the time, what we'll find is that they will certainly be looking to their own resources in the first instance to address the areas where we have been critical of them, but they'll also be looking outside to the improvement service and also to other councils. We see more evidence of that too. So there's quite a lot of evidence now of councils having, say, management meetings where the, the senior management of another council will be invited periodically to come along and present on what it is that we are doing, because that has been seen to be something that represents good practice that the, the, uh, the council in question would be interested in. So that gives you a flavour, I think, of the kind of things that we do see in our work that councils are doing. And as I said um, to begin with, you would hope and expect that is the case, because if you think that you can contend with what they've had to deal with over the last six, seven, eight years, and what is in prospect over the foreseeable future, if they think they can contend with that simply from their own devices, then I think they're, they're heading for more difficulty than they need. OK, thank you. That's uh, very useful. Um, I've got another question around um, education and social work. Um, I mean, this, as you note in the report, takes up 71% of councils' uh, budgets. But we're seeing in both fields of education and social work increasing uh, reforms taking place, stimulated by Parliament and government, uh, both in terms of governance, for example, the Governance Review in Education, and in terms um, of funding. And given, I mean, you give an example of Inverclyde Council, which um, 
if it makes 5% savings in education, social work and other protected budgets, will need to potentially make savings of over 40% in other uh, budgets. Given that, you know, for local people, trading standards, environmental health, housing, planning, leisure are all very, very important things for which people expect good services, um, and yet they have less control over those as a consequence of the fact that government and this parliament is making demands on these big services. Is there a case for looking at the governance and performance of local authorities for education and social work as one and the rest as another? Um, so, I mean, the, the point is absolutely well made, Mr Whiteman. I think there's um, no doubt that, as, as the chair mentioned in his opening remarks, the more that the big services are, um, relatively speaking, protected, then obviously the bigger the impact on other things. Um, and, and that's why we think uh, and why we urge councils to think differently and out the box and to do good options appraisals um, as to how these things can be delivered um, better, more efficiently. Um, we don't we don't subscribe to the uh, the notion that we are in the business of managed decline here. Uh, I don't think that's what the Commission would say at all. I think we are uh, rightly and appropriately demanding of councils to say, well, um, if you, for example, uh, look at some of the um, performance evidence that's in here in terms of the variation, both in terms of unit cost and performance, if everyone was performing as well and as efficiently as the best council on the land, then that would go a long way to helping this uh, solution uh, or to, to finding a solution. And alongside that, uh, we do see more evidence now of councils, some of the stuff that we've uh, captured in Exhibit 7, doing uh, some more uh, innovative things in terms of how things are how things are organised. So that's a long way round of saying um, they absolutely need to, to figure that out. They need to be talking to other councils in their area. So you'll be aware that um, there's the Northern Alliance, um, which is a, a combination of um, uh, several councils in the North and North East, which, which recognised and had initially started uh, with a kind of shared problem around teacher recruitment uh, and it's blossomed from there. So there is there is good stuff happening out there about councils talking to each other and pulling together to ensure that uh, they're grappling with the big uh, issues they face. Air, the three Ayrshire councils uh, joining up increasingly on various things. So we can see regional models developing already, I think, um, notwithstanding the, the more formal governance reviews that are around. Um, and I think that we'll, we'll be seeing, we will absolutely be seeing more of that, I think. I think what, what's really important from our perspective is that those decisions are taken well, that the, the information is good for councillors to take those kind of decisions and that the decisions are, are based on good, solid evidence as to how this thing's going to move forward. Let me just add two points to that. First would be that whether or not some further degree of separation of those higher priority and bigger services from the rest of local government services would be of any benefit depends, for me at least, partly on the funding arrangements that would go with it, because it's a funding issue that fundamentally, I think, is, is driving some of the, uh, the service and performance matters that we highlight in the report. So um, you would need to look at that as well, and you could get to a situation conceivably where um, the remaining services were further starved of resources, and that wouldn't have served any purpose in terms of making them more sustainable. But I think beyond that, there's also a, a, an issue, and I mentioned partnership earlier. Um, that the other side of that is that the partnerships that councils are working uh, with now are a reflection of the fact that the outcomes that people are entitled to expect from public services and the spending that goes with them are complex, interrelated, and can't, by and large, be identified for a particular sector, not even one as wide as local government. So there would be risks, I think, in achieving some of these outcomes if we had um, yet more um, balkanisation and complexity than we already have within the public sector as a whole. So I would counsel caution about that. In our work, we think hard about the, the environment in which councils in particular have to work, and that makes me reflective about um, solutions that looks, look um, clear because they're structural, but might not necessarily have the result that was intended. Thank you. Okay, um, Elaine Smith. <coughs> Thanks very much, convener. I was quite interested in some of, of your answers there. And in fact, Mr. McKinley, you actually said that we're moving towards regional models. And I wonder what your opinion is then on the fact that we had regional models right up until the 1990s. We had regional models, regional councils that dealt with education and social work. 
and we had district councils that then dealt with other issues. And given that you have outlined that there's a squeeze on uh, on the other services because of the big services which are taken up to 80 percent, I think it says in your report, uh, is there now is it now the time to look again at the whole structure of local government? Is it time to make these regional models perhaps more, um, you know, to put them on a, a different footing? Do we need to reorganise local government? Uh, well, you mentioned Fraser's comments. I wonder if he wanted to, uh, to. to explain himself. I can certainly comment afterwards. Yeah, no. Um, so I think it's a it's a really important question, and and uh, and I think the balance is always between the thing I was describing, which is councils themselves, in on some topics and in some areas, thinking that this is the best way to deliver services. Um, and that's the kind of thing we are seeing developing on a regional basis. So it's not everything all the time, it's on specific things, whether it's roads or, or teachers or uh, or individual things. And I think that's quite a different thing to a, a more top-down, we're going to go through a big local government reorganisation. I think I think the reason there has been very little appetite for that in local government and uh, up, certainly up to this point in Scottish government is the amount of time and effort and energy that it takes to reorganise any public service, but councils in particular, probably takes away the focus and the energy from uh, councils trying to deliver the services that need to deliver. And I think that's that's where that's where they are. The government uh, has committed to doing a review of local government or local governance, um, and uh, they are also committed to bringing forward at some point uh, a local democracy bill. <coughs> um, that's very early days, I think, but I would I would expect that those kinds of things would be the vehicles where exactly that kind of question would come up. And do you think overall that it is a willingness here for councils to collaborate not only with other councils but also with their communities um, and their areas to try and do things differently? Uh, on the whole, I think there definitely is. Um, we've mentioned the challenges that that poses, but I should also balance the books, if you like, by saying that we recognise a lot of effort going into uh, the work that's needed to work in that fashion collaboratively with others. Um, we're going to do a piece of work um, with some of the other scrutiny bodies uh, over the next year to 18 months that will look in the framework of the Community Empowerment Act at what is being done at a very local level to give substance to that. And I think that will be an interesting piece of work because that, if you like, is where the action now is in, in that regard. But just to come back to your previous question, I'm not going to give you a direct answer um, about whether um, I think some form of reorganisation is important or not. What I'm going to say is that the evidence in our report suggests that there's quite a lot of mileage still in working within the system that we have. The variances in performance, the variances in cost are in some cases still quite striking. And if everybody was operating at the level of the best in both those regards, things would be on a much better footing across the board than they are now. And that, for me, is the productive way to look at this at the moment. That's where the action ought to be if we're going to maintain and hopefully improve the level of services that the public expect from councils. OK, thanks. OK. Um, OK, we'll go to uh, Jenny Gorith now. Thank you. Good morning to the panel. Um, I just want to ask, start by asking quite a general question. Um, Mr Hines, you said at the start of the session that uh, the Commission wants local authorities to identify their priorities clearly and, they won't, and you want that to be communicated effectively to the public. So I just wonder what your view is um, on Council's ability then to resource uh, effective long-term financial uh, strategies and planning. Well, we've covered in the financial overview um, for the last two years now, I think the, the difficulty that Councils face when the funding so much of it coming from the Scottish Government is on a one-year basis. So I think it would be right to acknowledge in the first instance that that isn't as helpful as it could be, and we've said as much. Um, but we've also said um, that despite that, a number of councils are producing viable long-term plans. Um, so you have to make perhaps more assumptions than you would do if you had the figures clearly in front of you. You have to look at a wider range of scenarios. But those are all skills and good things to be doing in any event. And even if you had more certainty over the long term about the funding, the other imponderables would still be there. What are the demographic changes going to be? What other issues are we going to face at a local level that might be unique to us as opposed to generic for Scotland as a whole? So all those things factor into good long term planning. And therefore, we've got no hesitation in saying that councils need to be good at that and get that onto a solid footing. And it starts with clarity about priorities. And that brings me back to the point that I made. 
in my opening remarks, which is that I'm not saying that we as a commission will be entirely neglectful of an area that doesn't seem to be very well handled in a council. It's not performing very well. Just because the council has said that's not a priority for us, it might not be as high a priority as something else, but it remains a responsibility of the council. So we expect to see reasoning behind the decisions that are made, and we expect to see resources following that vision, that thinking, those strategies. If that has been done, we will look differently to an area that perhaps isn't performing as well as it could do. That's not to say that we won't be critical of it, but we'll be doing it hopefully with an understanding eye. Okay, thank you. Um, just to kind of drill down on a couple of key points there, one of the, the biggest issues with regard to long-term uh, planning is workforce planning. And I note that the report uh, notes that half of Scotland's councils do not have organisation-wide workforce plans in place, and therefore one of your recommendations is that that is brought in. Um, so one of the examples I'm, I'm going to give is from teaching. And Mr Hines, um, you may well be acquainted with Fife Council's approach to teaching recruitment. Um, and in my experience as a principal teacher, um, I was involved in a generic recruitment process this time two years ago. So what the authority does in Fife is they don't identify where the vacancies are. They put out a generic uh, application process. And then after, I think, June, very late on in the day, they then appoint members of staff to jobs. So it's retrospective um, and it's uh, reactive as opposed to proactive when they know, I suppose, kids do their course choices in February. So they actually are well aware of what kind of numbers are going to look like in terms of their staffing requirements earlier in their year. So my experience in Fife Council, the authority there were not very good at their workforce planning. Um, so I just wonder then, if more than half of authorities at the moment don't have workforce plans in place, do you think there's capacity in the system just now for the others to catch up? Um, so, so I think the short answer to that would be yes. Um, I think they do need to. I think what we see... Um, and, and, as you, and as you know, the, the absence of a workforce plan uh, can affect all bits of your people management, including recruitment. But I think what we've been seeing, and this is the, the point we make in part two of the report, is that councils have been reducing the number of staff they have overall. Um, and up until this point, too many councils have been doing that in the absence of a, of a good workforce plan. So lots of councils have, have put out a, a general call for voluntary redundancies and I can understand why they did that because they had to save money quite quickly. The risk of that though is that you've got people leaving the organisation that actually one or two years down the line you really would rather not have lost. Mm -hmm. um, so in the absence of that good workforce plan about looking three, five, ten years ahead about what shape of the workforce do we need, what skills do we need, how are we going to build our social care workforce into the future. Without those kind of good strategies and plans in place, um, it feels a little bit like uh, councils are operating blind. So that's why we are. Um, that's why the commission have been very clear on it here. We will then be following uh, that up in all of our audits of individual councils because obviously the, the picture varies across the piece. Um, and so this is something that we will be turning turning the volume up a little bit. I think um, over the next few well because it's such an important part of councils being fit for the future. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay, supplementary, Graham Simpson. Yeah, following on from that, very, very quick. Um, you mentioned uh, redundancies. A number of councils have have had uh, and continue to have a policy of no compulsory redundancies. Do you think that is uh, hampering their ability to plan their workforces? Um, so we haven't seen any evidence of that. To date, I don't think that's the problem. I don't think the the, com the, the no compulsory redundancies is entirely a uh, legitimate policy choice for a council to make. Um, is is the issue? I I think um, because apart from anything else, you can you can target voluntary redundancy schemes on specific bits of the workforce if you want to. It doesn't have to be an open ended thing. So, um, and and as we see that councils have been prudent with their finances and reserves, generally speaking, are in not a bad place. So they can. They can they can actually afford to invest in these kinds of things. So, so the short answer, Mr. Simpson, is no. I don't think we have seen any evidence of of the no compulsory redundancy policies getting in the way of this. Okay. Alexander Stewart. Thank you, convener. Gentlemen, you've talked about the challenges that many councils face, and and there is no doubt there are many, and and you've touched on some of them. But when we talk about reporting and performance. Uh, that's how you're gauging how well a council and many people's perceptions of how well a council's managing is gauged on, on its reporting and its performance. Can I ask about where, whether the, when there's a need for cultural change and strategic improvement, whether that is actually taking place through the performance uh, process? Within, within councils? Within you council mean? themselves. Um, well, 
The answer would be yes, but not universally and not mm. to the same extent everywhere. And it's quite a complex area. Obviously, we're talking about leadership uh, and culture. Um, maybe an example would help because it's really difficult to give a, a general comment across the, the board on this. We've just, we're just publishing today, I think, the uh, Commission's findings along with the controller's report on Inverclyde Council, which is the first of the 32 councils in our new best value. And one of the things that we're saying in there is that we do detect um, a cultural shift within that organisation since 10 years ago when the previous best value report was done on them, where they were subject to quite a lot of criticism. Now, things like culture are pretty um, amorphous, are hard to define. But whatever it is, it takes quite a long time to change. And what we think we're seeing over a 10-year period is significant change in the culture of that particular organisation. So use it as an illustration. How does it come about? Um, we think it comes about because um, maybe a bit of a shock to the system, didn't do any harm in the first instance, but there was a positive response to that. There was clear leadership, both at the political and at the managerial level. There was a shared set of priorities, and that might strike you as being um, f uh, something to take for granted, but I wouldn't necessarily say that that is the case, and a focus on what needed to change. That then drives out into the organisation over a period of time, and it leaves us now, 10 years later, in a position where we're confident we can comment favourably on a cultural shift within that organisation. Um, so there's an illustration of what it might mean in practice for one organisation, and we're hoping that through reports like that, um, which all councils I know will read, that anything that they think that they could usefully take from that, they will. And, and performance when it's when it's talked about prioritising, because councils now have to prioritise. Uh, you know, you, you talked about managing change or uh, decline and all of that, uh, but it, it's all about how you prioritise your time, your resources, and your money to ensure that you get the best value you can uh, for the the assets or the employment or whatever you're trying to to manage and what you're ever trying to perform uh, in, in the process. So. Looking at all of that, how do councils then ensure that they are capturing all of that uh, in, in, in making it the best they can uh, for all of, the, all of their employees, for all of the communities they're representing? Uh, because they cannot give them everything. Uh, they have to be strategic. They have to talk about long-term, short-term planning. Uh, but they also have to prioritise what can and can happen uh, and, and expectations uh, uh, come into all of this as well. So it's trying to get that whole mix together uh, and it'd be quite good to hear your views on that. So, um, so as you know better than I do, it's not easy, I suppose <laughs> is the first thing to say. And um, but, but, I think it's, but I think the ingredients should be well understood, which is about a clarity of direction and priority. And that, is, as the Chair said earlier, doesn't mean that other things aren't important. It just means that some things are more important than others. It's then about ensuring that you're people, your money, your buildings, your information are aligned and uh, ready to support those priorities. And I think really importantly, to come back to a question that was uh, mentioned earlier, this is where the community engagement bit is absolutely critical. Because as you say, people will have different views about what's important. Um, and it's really important that if the council is having to invest in some areas and potentially disinvest in others, the community need to understand why that is the case and 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 be and be part of that whole process uh, and i think if there's one area of real development for councils I, I would i would say it's that it's about that community engagement bit in the decision making process that really now needs to go beyond a, a kind of broad brush consultation this is what we're doing what do you think kind of question it has to be more uh, bought in much earlier on so i think those would be the the things i would recognize i mean we've um, we've managed to get this far convener without mentioning the elections, but, but we have a great opportunity, I think. We have 32 new councils uh, in place, and, and one thing that the Commission is reminding everyone of is that the duty of best value rests with the council. So regardless of the le entirely legitimate political uh, activity that's going, that has been going on, and I'm sure will continue in, into the over the next few months, um, our point is that all the things you've just described um, are the responsibility of every single member in that council, and that's the basis on which we'll be doing our work. And 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 that has to be audited and scrutinised as well by everyone within that council. Uh, they they take on that that role and responsibility, whether they're in administration or in opposition, uh, as to what can be achieved. Uh, and I think it's that balance that you're trying to get, uh, and that if that can be achieved, then there can be real progress. Yeah. So so that so that cycle of performance has to include effective scrutiny, yep. by both at the kind of official level, but really the importantly with councillors, yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Okay. Can, you... Uh, can I maybe ask a little bit more about a line of questioning that a few members have raised, and that's in relation to driving 
performance improvement consistently across all local authorities and benchmarking exercises. Um, like Mr Simpson quite rightly was asking about how we improve staff absence levels uh, uh, in, in education and non-education, but just looking at the report again, things are actually technically improving in terms of staff absence, it's reducing. So not a wonderful story to tell, but a reasonable story to tell, but still inequalities between various councils. So if I was to look elsewhere within within the report, Exhibit 12 is a real kind of standout in relation to the cost of council tax collection. And, and, and I know that there doesn't seem to be any correlation between the, the unit cost of collecting council tax and the, the level of collection rates. Um, I pick a couple of examples. So approximately would appear in Glasgow or North Lanarkshire, it costs about 11 or 12 pounds per per council tax pair to collect council tax, but it's about four pound or so in Fife. That seems a dramatic difference. Say in defence of uh, Glasgow, because I know that you, you see in the report they've actually dramatically reduced it from over 18 pounds per, per unit uh, to just under 11 pounds per unit. There's still a, a reasonable reduction, but still a massive difference in terms of uh, the cost. So I'm just wondering, how do we drive change in this year? Because it would seem unacceptable to myself that there is such a variation. So, so how do we drive this change forward? I think that's a really important question. Um, it partly contains the answer within itself because you're right to point out that Glasgow has already improved significantly in that regard. And we would like to think that um, one of the benefits of exposing this comparison in that fashion is to raise sights about, if you like, the art of the possible. It would be easy, and I don't think for a second Glasgow would do this, to be self-congratulatory and say, well, it used to be 18 quid, now it's 11 quid, so we're doing really well. Um, but if you look at this, you realise that others might be doing better still. So I think that is the first point I would make. That's one way to drive improvement. Highlight that something better might be getting done elsewhere. But beyond that, I think, and this is now something for us as a commission, Council tax is a bit unlike um, sickness absence. I made the point earlier that that's relatively immune, if you like, to the socio-economic context within which a council operates. I don't think I would see council tax collection in the same light, because clearly it does make a difference whether you're trying to collect council tax in areas to the east, of, east end of Glasgow compared to, say, St Andrews, just to use the comparison with Fife. So you have to bring that relevant con context into account somehow. And the wrong way to do it is to say it's just that much harder in Glasgow, therefore this is the best that you can do. The right way to do it is to get into the bones of what it is that's actually distinguishing your performance from somebody else's over and above the environment in which you unavoidably have to work. And for us as a commission, we think that's maybe the next chapter in this story. We would like to get into the detail of this a little bit more. We know councils are doing it. And to understand better where the limitations are in terms of how good performance could get, just to give a, an example of why I say that, some preliminary analysis has been done by the Improvement Service that looks at education as an area suggests, and it's in their, their, their annual benchmarking report, that you could broadly say that about half of the difference that you can see the variation between councils in Scotland and educational attainment, about half of it you can explain by relevance, by reference rather, to the socio-economic context in which children are being educated. What about the other half? Where's the difference about the other half? that looks as though it's got something to do with performance. So that's, for me, the next area to look at in terms of driving improvement. Is, is that the kind of thing that the Council Commission would look at, like do, do a focused report specifically on council tax collection and, and produce uh, exemplars of best practice and then really build relationships with local authorities to drive that change? Because I'm conscious you don't run local authorities. What you do is, is you is you look at the performance of them and make some general recommendations when you do this overview report. So where where would you take that forward? You said you want to get into the meat of this a little bit more. How how would that be taken forward? Well, at least in two areas. One, which we already do, if you look to the report we did on rose maintenance last year, you'll find a flavour of what you've just described okay. in that report. So we are looking increasingly at how it varies from one part of the country to another. So on a thematic basis, if you like, or a service basis, and we will always do that. But I think also in, in relation to future iterations of this report, I would expect to see at least, well, we'll examine the, the possibility of getting into that in a bit more detail. I don't underestimate the challenges involved in it. It's a lot of data, a lot of analysis, and some of it will be quite complex. But I think as a contribution to public debate on this, 
it's the obvious place to want to get to, and that's the second place in which I would expect to see us take it forward. Okay, and final question in relation to benchmarking performance. I know my deputy commissioner wants want to come in as well. It's exhibit 13, which I find quite difficult to understand, which probably says more about myself than, than the exhibit. It's in relation to uh, the cost of cleaning our streets effectively across local authorities and a cleanliness score. So. Uh, is performance improving or decreasing in, in relation to that? I think it's clear to see from that one of the areas that local authorities are either cut uh, financial investment or have sought to do service reform to do efficiency savings. You pay your money, you take your choice and how you want to kind of frame that has been in, in terms of uh, street cleaning with quite dramatic uh, cuts in, in, in local authorities across Scotland with a consequential dip in performance, it, it would appear. One or two local authorities might have managed to make a substantial cut and a slight improvement. So, for example, if I'm reading this correctly, 31, 32% cut in Falkirk, but a modest increase in, in, in performance. That would seem to be quite a commendable achievement uh, when you look at the, the cuts across the board and other local authorities and a fairly directly corresponding uh, diminution in, in how clean our streets are in local authorities. So what did Falkirk do well that others didn't, and how do we promote that going forward? OK, well, you're not the only one who has some difficulty reading this. I had to confess to my colleagues when we were waiting to come in that it only just dawned on me last night that those that um, representation is meant to be the map of Scotland. I hadn't done yes, I <laughs> well, you that. You're well yes. ahead of me then, Convener, because it took me a while to realise that. <laughs> but I, I would I would probably contest one of the things that you said. Um, I don't think it does demonstrate there's a very clear correlation between reductions in expenditure and reductions in service. It's much more mixed than that, which is why I said earlier um, that there clearly is the possibility of reducing expenditure and at the very least maintaining, co maintaining performance. And you're right to pick Falkirk as a conspicuous example of just that. But you can also see that there are examples where, um, even though councils have increased expenditure, they haven't necessarily got um, a big enough bang for their buck. Some of them have improved the service as a consequence, maybe as a consequence, but they haven't improved it as much as they've increased the expenditure. So the correlation just doesn't seem to me to be that clear. And in terms of how then to use this as a stimulus for improvement, come back to what I've said before. If even one council, let's take Falkirk in that example, has managed to find a way of keeping the streets at least as clean as they were before, but reduce the budget for that significantly, then I think every other council in Scotland should be asking Falkirk how they did that. And I'm pretty sure those conversations will be taking place, not just for street cleanliness, but for other things that I know they're comparing. Okay, well, I suppose I'm pleased that I, I, I understood the table <laughs> half correctly. I'll, I'll, set, I'll, settle, I'll settle for that. Um, so... You would assume that those conversations will, will take place. Should we assume they take place, or does there have to be a, a structured child approach to that? Or do we just let our local authorities get on with it? And I'm sure they will want to do it. Why wouldn't they want to do it? But what role would the Accounts Commission have in relation to driving some of that forward? Well, we, we will report, as I've said, um, in these terms uh, for future overview reports and perhaps in greater depth. We also have an ongoing engagement with the Improvement Service who underpin this benchmarking and other work and the expectations that we have as a commission are clear to them. They know that. And the fact that we are reporting it is testimony to those expectations. We will also, I'd like to be in a position in future reports to be able to say something more about the nature of the work that we believe is taking place behind the scenes, where councils are looking at each other's performance and their costs and asking how do you do that. We haven't got substantive evidence of that at the moment to put into this report, but it would be one of the things that we'd like to be able to do to provide that assurance going forward. OK, and um, I, I, I'm guessing that some of the exhibits in this report may inform future th thematic work that might take place. You, you mentioned, I think, roads, roads previously, so we can maybe anticipate in the years ahead doing specific work streams around some of the, the more interesting findings within this report? Any ideas what what's likely to be next? Um, well, what I would want to say is that we think that the, the risk that is posed to the services that have a lesser degree of protection is a significant public interest issue. Um, so without giving... Um, I can't give a commitment at this stage because it's still part of our planning process, but I think our attention has been drawn increasingly to those areas. 
Um, so there's a whole range of them. If you leave education and social work to one side, street cleanliness would be an example. There's many others, and I think we'd be doing a public service if we looked at some of those areas in a greater degree of scrutiny. That, that's very helpful. Uh, Elaine Smith. Thanks, convener. Um, so we're reaching the end of the session, but I would quite like to go back to the beginning of your report and your chair's introduction. And for my colleague's benefit, it's page four, paragraph three that I want to specifically look at. But the context of what I want to ask you is that also in your report, you say that um, between 2016-17 and 2017-18, total revenue funding from the Scottish Government will reduce by about £216 million in real terms. Now, in this Chair's introduction, uh, Douglas Sinclair says, councils are increasingly relying on use of reserves to bridge projected funding gaps. Moreover, recent best value audits have highlighted a dependency on incremental changes to services, increasing charges and reducing employee numbers in order to make savings. These are neither sufficient nor sustainable solutions for the scale of the challenge facing councils. So my question then is, are you actually saying that alternative forms of service delivery and working together, the things you've been talking about during this session, is the answer rather than increased central funding or indeed just less cuts? I don't think there's any one answer, but I think um, different ways of delivering services must be part of it, just because of the comments that you've drawn our attention to. If there's no end in sight um, to the trend of reductions in resources, then I think it would be foolish to carry on just responding to that incrementally year on year. You have to try and get ahead of the game a little bit. So that's what we intend when we enjoin councils in that fashion, to think differently and to look at some hard and radical options about different ways of delivering services, but that's not a silver bullet, to use the cliché. Um, there are various other things that councils can and do uh, particularly well that help with this regard. I mentioned Inverclyde because it's the report that's out today. If you look at that report, you'll see that without having a kind of magical approach to transformative change, they have managed to turn that organisation around very well just by doing some of the things that Fraser described earlier. So that also, ongoing service reviews, a clear idea about what you want to do, what your priorities are, and putting your resources into those things, all of those basic elements of good management are also part of the answer here too. So we wouldn't say there's any one thing to, to which there would be a solution to the difficulty that councils face. But we also think um, that carrying on as if nothing had really changed seven or eight years ago and things were going to somehow reverse in the next five or six years is a mistake. And there's no indication that that is the case. And so we want councils to recognise that and to respond accordingly. By and large, they're doing it. And I do understand that, but is there a point where you're actually allowed to say all of these reserves have been taken into account, changes have been made, but at this point we have to say in a report, is it a, are you allowed to say that actually the cuts are having a huge impact? Well, I think we are saying that. There's no doubt that cuts are having an impact. The use of reserves is something we draw attention to in all our reports and the main point I'd want to reiterate there is that if you use them simply as a means of tidying yourself over for another year or two, you're not going to be responding in the right way to the challenges you face. If you use them strategically and intelligently as a means of investment in order to change how you deliver services, that's the right response and that's what we expect councils to do. Okay, thanks. Okay, thank you. Um, time is almost upon us. Um, if any of our witnesses want to add anything before we close this particular session, there's a few moments. Okay, thank you. No, thank you, Commissioner. Okay, well, all that remains me for to do is to thank all three of you for coming along this morning. We appreciate the time we've taken. It's been an interesting session, and we'll suspend briefly until we prepare for the next agenda item. Thank you.
Okay, welcome back everyone. We're now moved to agenda item three, which is post legislative scrutiny of the Disabled Persons Parking Places Scotland Act 2009. The committee will take evidence from Jackie Bailey, MSP, on its post legislative scrutiny of the Act. Jackie Bailey was the member responsible for introducing the bill in 2008. I think I sat on the local government committee at, at that time. Okay. Miss Bailey, so can I, can I welcome you here this morning? Thank you for coming along and give you the opportunity to make some opening remarks. Thank you very much, convener, and thank you for the invitation. I'm very pleased that the committee is doing post-legislative scrutiny in this area. Um, and you will forgive me, of course, because eight years ago is a long time, so some of the fine detail may escape me, but, but let me give you some of the background to why um, I engaged with the process in the first place. Um, it started with a constituency case probably about a decade ago, um, which seems a long time indeed, and it arose as a result of a neighbour dispute where, frankly, um, the next door neighbour to the constituent that came to me persistently parked in his disabled parking bay outside his home. The nature of his disability was that if that happened, he couldn't literally get out of his car and get to his front door and into his home. Um, what I did, as you would expect any MSP to do, is I contacted the police. The police told me they couldn't enforce it because it was an advisory disabled parking bay. I contacted the council that put in the bay. The council couldn't do anything either. I went so far as to put the neighbour on the front page of my local newspaper in the hope that that might embarrass him into better behaviour. Unfortunately, that didn't work. Um, and I contacted in, in my area the Western Berkshire Access Panel who were very helpful in suggesting that actually what we now needed to do was consider whether legislation um, was suitable. So I commenced a, a two-year journey in, in investigating whether this was something that would be subject of a private member's bill um, and indeed was very pleased that the Act passed in 2009. Now, you've taken wide-ranging evidence. It might be helpful, and I'll certainly, in response to questions, indicate that the Act itself and the bill we brought forward is actually very narrowly focused. It does a couple of things. Firstly, it takes all the advisory bays in Scotland and it makes them enforceable. Um, and it does that through a process of engagement by local authorities. And the second is to look at all off-street parking in private premises, private businesses, um, and encourage them to do likewise. Um, the bill skirted between areas that are devolved and reserved, and I think we tried to manage the balance pretty well. Um, at the end of the day, for me, it is about how we ensure that disabled people get access um, to their homes, to shops, to retail facilities in the same way that the rest of us enjoy. And, you know, I hope the bill has contributed to doing just a little bit of that. Thank you, convener. Thank you very much, Ms Bailey. We'll, we'll move to questioning. Uh, Graham Simpson, MSP. Thank you. Um, so you've, give, you've given us the background. Um, do you think that the, the Act, and you've heard all the evidence that we've heard, um, has achieved uh, its objectives in practice? Um, it, it's, it's an interesting question and absolutely the right one to ask, because my belief is, yes, on balance it has. Because when you consider what the Act was trying to do, which essentially was to make all advisory bays enforceable, it has actually achieved that. The evidence you've taken shows, I think, quite interesting variations in enforcement activity. And if I can focus on that um, just now, um, and obviously develop it with, with other questioning, but... If you look at local authorities at the time where we were considering the on-street parking provisions, um, six out of the 32 or thereabouts actually had decriminalised their own parking. The rest relied on police enforcement. That position has now changed to 16 out of 32 local authorities having decriminalised their parking and another two, I understand, being in the pipeline. The reality with that is local authorities will therefore employ wardens. Those wardens can be directed. And as a response to parliamentary questions I laid previously, what is fascinating is that the majority of local authorities don't just cover their costs, they actually um, generate a surplus, which many put back into the general funds and are applied to other useful things that the local authority do. Um, I do accept in areas where the police still enforce um, fixed penalty notices for car parking, it's not 
a top priority for them. So the enforcement tends to be reactive rather than proactive. And particularly in, in town centres, it's much more proactive because there's a density of parking there. But in residential areas, it is reactive enforcement. Now, in the situation that my constituent was in, the police would have been able to act. But I think the expectation of the police being in those areas, um, you know, is, is probably a bit much when there are other priorities and there are resource constraints. That's one aspect of it. In terms of um, off-street parking that's there in, you know, private businesses and out-of-town shopping centres, um, the interesting thing is that is that area is reserved. We can't legislate to compel private business owners to do anything. But the minister at the time actually was very helpful in saying that there are requirements placed on them by the Disability Discrimination Act of 1995. Um, and as part of that, this bill served to emphasise their duties in that regard, particularly in terms of making reasonable access um, for customers and for users of, of their service. So on the one hand, you had some you know, obvious areas for enforcement where we had responsibility on the off-street parking, uh, on the on-street parking, sorry, and in the off-street parking where we didn't have legislative competence to actually force people to do this. We tried to encourage and we tried to use local authorities as an exemplar in their own area who understood what, what was going on um, to do so. So on balance, I would say, if you're looking at trying to improve the rights of disabled people, um, and, you know, in a very small, focused way, um, trying to ensure that parking is enforceable, then I think the bill has been successful. Okay. Is there anything now that you would change? Uh, it, th there's always the benefit of hindsight is a wonderful thing. Um, I think what we tried to do with the, the bill, and I remember discussions with the bill team, is to future-proof it. So what we didn't do is specify in the bill what the transport regulations that needed to be followed would be, or indeed what enforcement measures needed to be followed. What the bill did was said, whatever the traffic signs and regulations are um, at that point in time um, and in the future would be applied to the bill. So whatever the changes are to the other pieces of legislation, the bill still stands. So I'm, I'm pleased we did that because obviously this is an area that does move on. Um, I think with the benefit of hindsight, I think local authorities are finding the duties placed on them slightly onerous. Um, and in some of the evidence from you know, the supermarkets and the private car park owners that you had in here, they're clearly doing a lot already that is positive about enforcement of the bays. I think the difference is they're choosing to do it themselves rather than having local authorities do it for them. Um, I think the Fife example, Fife was mentioned earlier today, is actually proportionate and sufficiently proactive because they don't write to everybody every two years. They have a constant website that's refreshed. They took care of their in-house parking first. So they dealt with, if you like, um, their own facilities on and off street. Then they looked at other public bodies like health centres and hospitals, and then they've engaged in conversations with supermarkets and others. Um, and as part of planning and development, they talk to people about new developments so that these things are built in from the start. The fact that it's not local authorities providing that isn't, for me, the test of success. If they are doing it, and using other means of enforcement, then that, to me, is a success of the bill. But I do recognise that some local authorities might find it onerous, and therefore I would suggest the sharing of good practice, which I understand the Minister is about to do. OK. So do, I mean, does it really matter um, whether councils um, write, write out to private car park operators if those private car park operators have have already uh, made improvements? If, if they're already operating regimes then, and we're aware of it, then I don't see the need to constantly do that. Yeah. We weren't prescriptive about, you know, you need to write to them. We simply said contact needs to be established. Now, you know, I think Fife's way of doing it is certainly proportionate. Mm. Um, so, you know, I welcome the fact that there will be different experiences across different local authorities. And Hamza Youssef, the minister, is bringing together a stakeholder group 
of parking managers. I would encourage them in that stakeholder group to perhaps include some of the private sector, but also organisations yeah. representing disabled people too. Okay. Okay. okay, thank you. Alexander Stewart. Thank you, Kanina. We've talked about inconsistencies in enforcement. Uh, and, and when we had some of the uh, groups here, they talked about a national campaign. They felt there should be some kind of public awareness campaign uh, to try and educate uh, and inform uh, the public about where we are. What are your views on that? And did you think about that when you were putting the bill together? Yeah, we did. And in fact, in evidence to your predecessor committee, um, they raised the need for a public awareness and information campaign. Um, the majority of us are actually quite law-abiding um, and we tend to avoid you know um, committing offences particularly like parking in, in disabled parking spaces but it had the benefit of the bill being taken forward of raising awareness um, not just in here but across the country um, I was sent a variety of photographs which I won't share with the committee of leading lawyers parking in disabled parking bays, using their mother's blue badge to access parking outside Glasgow Sheriff Court, um, pictures of police cars parked in disabled parking bays, um, you name it. So, so it raised awareness. And what we asked the minister at the time, Stuart Stevenson, to do was consider a public awareness campaign, perhaps led by Transport Scotland or the police or whoever, um, that, that drove home some of those messages because there were some really powerful messages coming from disabled people the the catchphrase i always remember is you know if you want my disabled parking place please have my disability too and it led people to understand the consequences for somebody who is disabled of actually parking in a disabled space if you understand that the majority of people do change their behaviors um so i th thought at the time a public awareness campaign was essential it shouldn't always be left to the voluntary sector to do these things. Government should step up to the plate. I'm disappointed because I don't think there was one, but it's never too late, um, and it's something I would actively encourage the Transport Minister to consider. And, 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 and I'd agree, I think, that you hit the nail on the head because if, if we can get that message over uh, uh, and use lots of examples, uh, then, then the public will look at it differently. Uh, and I think that's, that's vitally important and may well become a recommendation as we progress. Oh, Thank ste you. oh, steady on, Mr. Sure, yeah. we're still to discuss that. <laughs> May well. You never know. Uh, Mr. Whiteman. Uh, thanks, convener. Uh, I mean, first of all, how, how is your constituent? Um, they, they have subsequently passed away. I'm oh, sorry to. Sorry. Right. <laughs> it has been ten years. It has. <laughs> ten years. Good. Good. Um, uh, you, you mentioned that the bill navigated uh, reserved and uh, devolved functions and, and had to do that. Um, there have been changes subsequently. Um, signage is now uh, devolved, and we've heard views, um, principally from disabled groups, about, uh, and indeed from councils, about whether signage should always be required, and sometimes it's a bit of a hindrance. Uh, be useful for your comments on that. And also, we've heard evidence from Glasgow and Aberdeen that they would like um, to be able to create enforceable disabled parking places without the need for designation order. Um, I must say I'm not clear if that's a devolved thing or not, but maybe you could uh, comment on that as well. Um, let me take the last one first, because at the time, the reason we had all these advisory bays, something like 85% of all bays in Scotland were advisory, was because the whole process of a traffic regulation order was so complicated, so long and costly. And what was happening is, um, instead of doing them in large batches, local authorities were doing them in, in ones and twos. Um, so it wasn't a very efficient system, but actually the whole process of TROs was quite onerous. I'm not sure whether that's devolved or not, but I do know that the signage element is devolved. And in relation to TROs, right at the start of this, um, I think the self-same local authorities, echoed by others, said, if you could just fix this process, then we wouldn't use or see the need to use advisory bays because the process would be simpler. Okay. Um, in terms of the traffic regulations, you're absolutely right. Um, they were devolved to the Scottish Government and the Scottish Parliament on the 23rd of May 2016. Um, we haven't changed anything about them so far. Um, that, that power has yet to be used. But at the same time across the UK, um, current traffic sign requirements were changed in 2016. Um, and the UK Department for Transport 
published a circular um, on new regulations. And if I can read them out, this might be helpful. Because the placing of upright parking signs in combination with bay markings is no longer required. Instead, it is for traffic authorities to determine the appropriate signage and marking combination needed to convey to drivers any waiting, loading and parking controls contained in an underpinning traffic order. So already, whether you follow the UK regulations um, now, local authorities have the power to do this. I suspect that they are waiting until they get clarity and guidance from the Scottish Government now that the power is devolved. But the, the legal contention is they could actually use these powers just now to do away with the requirement for signage. It does mean we need to make sure that the bays are marked appropriately and you know painting is refreshed um, from time to time, but you can do away with the expensive signage that local authorities have to put in place. And I think that would undoubtedly be helpful. And again, I would encourage the Scottish Government to look at this. It doesn't change my bill, because my bill um, is adapted to whatever regulation is in place at any given time. Okay, that's useful for now, I'll come back later. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, we heard a lot about um, off-street parking um, on, on, on private land. We, uh, uh, as you know, Ms Bailey, we had um, a representative of one of the large supermarkets here and one of the private car park uh, providers. Uh, and evidence that appeared quite patchy whether local authorities were actually necessarily meeting their obligations in terms of contacting uh, such organisations uh, at least every every two years. And when they did do that, some local authorities would write out to all the kind of main players in, in their local authority area. Others would put a, a notice in a newspaper or what have you. I'm just wondering, on the reflection, if you think there's been appropriate buy-in from local authorities in relation to that, or indeed uh, are any buy-in at all from... Uh, the, the private sector, and if there's a, maybe an opportunity to improve things in this area. Okay. Um, let me deal with the private sector first, because I think what was unusual at the very start of the bill process um, is that with the awareness being raised, suddenly there was a queue of supermarkets, there was a queue of out-of-town retail centres, all competing with each other um, to talk about their disabled bay enforcement practice. And what was interesting is, you know, when you delved beneath that at the time to understand what was going on, um, Asda, for example, um, had surveyed their customers, and 93%, which is staggering, of their customer base said they wanted disabled bays enforced outside Asda. So for them, it became not just an issue about disabled people and their spending power, but it became an issue about all of their customers caring about this. Now, Asda, um, and there are other supermarkets, but Asda, at the time, used the fines quite imaginatively to then pass on any profit they made to local community groups and voluntary sector organisations in their patch. And I'm sure the convener, um, having one on his patch, will have probably presented some of those checks in the past. Um, so they used it as a means of um, improving customer service to all customers and paying something back into the community. Tesco's, I know you took evidence from, um, they engage uh, at the time, I think it was um, marshals that would enforce. Now what they're doing is using new technology and handheld operation that leaves most of the enforcement with the supermarket. Um, and you also took evidence from NCP who seem to be very proactively um, enforcing their disabled parking bays within their own provision. So I think the private sector that understand that this is a customer service issue have actually, as a consequence of the bill, never mind the act, taken measures already. And I do know that local authorities have been proactive where there are planning applications come in, particularly from you know out of town or town centre retail, or indeed from supermarkets, um, have worked with them to ensure that there is a sufficiency of disabled parking bays. Where the difference lies that I touched on earlier is that actually most of these companies prefer to have control of enforcement themselves because it gives them the opportunity to cancel fines if they feel it's appropriate to do so without prolonged appeals process. Um, it gives them the opportunity to be flexible in how they respond to, to particular issues. Um, so I would say that if there is a lack in the private sector, it is those existing businesses um, that are perhaps smaller, that perhaps, you know, on our high streets, that really don't understand the need for this, but 
on high streets, I would look to local authorities to ensure that there is ample provision and that it's enforceable. Turning to local authorities, I mean, as with everything, there has been a variable response. Some have embraced this and seen this as a disability rights issue and have been very proactive in trying to ensure that there is both capacity and that that capacity is enforced. I think you'll find there are issues about parking enforcement in general, um, and lots of people will be in our constituency surgeries saying, you know, this street has got double yellow lines, but people park on it all the time, or, you know, these, these areas aren't currently enforced, um, or somebody's parking over my driveway. That is a problem that local authorities grapple with. My contention is that certainly in terms of promoting off-street parking, um, encouraging the private sector to do this, keeping awareness and pressure up, I think is really important. Because at the end of the day, if you're balancing you know, the needs of business as they perceive it and the rights of disabled people, um, I think getting the balance right relies on people reminding businesses exactly what's required by the Disability Discrimination Act um, in ensuring access to their premises, to services, um, and ensuring that people with a disability are able to move around you know, and go to the shops, go to their town centres in the same way as the rest of us are. That's very helpful, Ms Bale. I'm just wondering, in terms of fines that may or may not be imposed by, by supermarkets, um, it, it, it's often asserted that it's a very grey area whether those fines are actually legally enforceable or not. So is there a, is there a weakness in, in, in self-enforcement regimes by, by supermarkets, for example? Yeah, um, the, there has been comment in the past as to whether these, these are enforceable. My understanding is, is that they are, um, but I'm not a lawyer, so you would need to, to check with somebody more qualified than I am. Certainly, the majority of people who get fined at supermarkets pay their fines, um, and it has had a deterrent effect. So, you know, the, the examples I gave when taking this bill through of people reporting to me, um, young men driving up in their their flash cars, parking in the disabled bay and saying, it's okay, I'm only here for a minute, I'm just in to get a loaf of bread or a pint of milk or whatever it is, and the disabled person being stranded. That kind of thing is, I would say, happening less because people are more aware and because, see, when you've been fined a couple of times, um, if you're not a persistent offender, you, you will stop engaging in that kind of behaviour because it's expensive. Um, so, you know, as to whether these are legally acceptable, they're certainly in place. They've certainly been you know, running for some time now. Um, and if there is a challenge to them, then you know, I would expect the courts to, to resolve that. OK, thank you. I'm just wondering, one, one of the, the concerns about, um, I suppose, supermarkets, we'll stick with supermarkets, the most self-evident one that I think all of our constituents will, will see on a daily basis, perhaps, is, is that there will be varying degrees of standards and enforcement across various supermarket chains and actually within those supermarket chains in terms of layout of car parks, the amount of disabled parking bays there are, how vigorously they enforce those parking bays, how confident staff feel in, in, in terms of asking a, a customer to, to move. Um, because you can enforce after the event, Ms Bailey, but then the disabled person doesn't get their parking bay. This is really about just occasionally someone saying, right, get your car shifted, you can't park there. That's really what we'd like to see in, in the large supermarkets. Should we perhaps be moving towards, uh, whether statutory or otherwise, an agreed set of minimum standards across supermarkets, which perhaps they could sign up to with local authorities in a proactive way, much the same way they were when you first took your bill through, where supermarkets were falling over each other to to, to be the, the, the exemplar of best practice. Perhaps we have to return to that and reinvigorate that somehow? Yeah, and I couldn't agree more. I think minimum standards of what should be expected across the board, whether you're in you know, Tesco or Asda or Morrison's or indeed anywhere like that, um, would be a good thing. Um, at the moment, my appreciation of it is that in some supermarkets, they bundle together, say, two or three nearby stores and that they share enforcement between them. So you would have a warden or a marshal 
who would appear from time to time. Um, certainly in others, and with the advent of new technology with Tesco, the ability to have in-store staff do that takes exactly the point that you're making, which is not after the event, but as it's happening, being able to provide evidence, but also encourage staff members to challenge people engaged in that behaviour. Um, most of the supermarkets I know gave training in customer service. Um, a lot of the private car parks, for example, gave quite a lot of training um, to their operatives to make sure they were approaching people in the right way. And they viewed it not just about really realising a fine or a profit from it, but about education so that that person didn't do it again. The fine is there if all else fails. Um, and I think supermarkets have been quite proactive in doing that. But you're right, there are variations. It would be good to have minimum standards across the board and for supermarkets to do what they do best, which is exceed them. So I, I suppose, uh, Ms Bailey, what, what I'm trying to get at is whether it would be a much more dynamic conversation if local authorities were to set those minimum standards or national minimum standards and then duties were placed. I mean, I'd much rather be voluntary, t to be honest, but voluntary doesn't always work. It's whether duties should be placed on the sector or not to conform. Perhaps they could help co-produce what those minimum standards look like, but at the moment, it does seem that the requirement to contact... Uh, off-sheet parking providers and, uh, and private providers, supermarkets in particular, is has been a little bit of a, a waste of time because it's kind of happening, it's kind of not happening. When it does happen, no one's responding. So there's a bit in the legislation which is really well-intentioned and could deliver improvement and change, but it's just kind of sitting there not really been used. So how do we transform the debate around that? Any suggestions? The, the, the problem you've got with imposing minimum standards is we don't have the legislative responsibility for doing so. So that's why the bill skirts as it does around the issue and uses encouragement and voluntary approaches to try and create change. But we also recognise that, that for some, um, because of the nature of the parking provision in their, their area, it's going to be really difficult to do. But we rely on local authorities as part of their planning duties not their parking management duty, but their planning duties to ensure that you know, the Disability Discrimination Act is, is applied, there are sufficient spaces, and at that point it is the point to encourage. Um, now, there is variation in what local authorities have done in terms of embracing this. The Fife example I thought was very proportionate and very sensible about the approach they took. If somebody writes to you once every two years and that's the only contact you have, um, then you're not going to be encouraged to do this. You're not going to understand why it's such a good thing to do. You maybe haven't heard of the Baywatch survey um, or the Capability Scotland survey that looked at you know, mystery shoppers and how they reacted um, and just the sheer scale of the abuse and the impact it then had on the retail provider. So actually making the business case to some of these retailers who aren't currently engaged, I think is the way forward. You could adopt an approach of minimum standards. I think you would butt up against the reservation in law, um, but, but I think certainly some local authorities would benefit from the sharing of good practice, which takes me back again to the Minister's stakeholder group. Um, it is something to, to be welcomed. Um, I understand the Minister is also consulting, if I'm right, on... Um, opportunities there are to deal with the misuse of um, advisory disabled off-street parking bays. So perhaps that government intervention and in bringing people together, which you know I would have welcomed at the beginning, is certainly something to be welcomed now. Good, but just for the record, you've certainly opened, Ms Bailey, to reframing the discussion with, sure. with, with the private sector to put, whether it's the issues around what is reserved or not reserved and always the issue about dictating what minimum standards look like, but some kind of best practice standard that the private sector could sign up to? I think, I think the British Parking Association may indeed have that already. Um, but yes, I think anything that promotes the increase of, one, enforceable disabled parking bays, and two, the actual enforcement, is to be welcomed in whatever sector it is. OK, thank you very much. Uh, Elaine Smith. Thanks, Convener. Morning, Jack. Thanks for joining us. Um, it's just to take this slightly further because I think there might be some confusion about the ongoing duty. Edinburgh City Council um, have basically said they've done the exercise four times and they feel it's labour intensive and resource intensive and costs 
I think they're saying up to 12,000 every two years, and they're not getting very many positive responses. And they then go on to say that actually it seems to them that once businesses establish they're responsible for the costs associated with the, the lines and signs, they then decide not to proceed. So do you think that, um, it, it, can there be a different approach? I mean, it would seem to me that they're, they're taking it very literally from the legislation, whereas from what you're saying, Fife are approaching it in a different way. So is there leeway for looking differently at the legislation? My understanding of the legislation as we wrote it is that there needs to be contact every two years. Right. How you do that contact, um, you know, provided it's regular, it's frequent, it's on a two-yearly cycle, okay. I think is best left to, to local authorities. Now, there is undoubtedly a difference between cities and you know, less urban um, local authorities, and they, they, they have um, different scales of responsibility in that regard. But already we're hearing that... that you don't have a requirement for signs anymore, that actually we're talking about painting a bay. The enforcement would be undertaken by the local authority where it's decriminalised parking or by the police. Um, actually being able to transfer that responsibility to somebody else, I would have thought, would be in the interest of, of the private sector. Um, so I'm not sure that, that cost necessarily is such a barrier. Mm -hmm. Once you understand, the benefit is it is to your business in terms of customer service. Um, so um, I'm not convinced that, that those local authorities who are saying it's far too onerous actually are thinking that creatively about it. Okay. Um, and again, it comes back down to a balance between um, you know, the, the duties placed on local authorities to enhance their local area um, and the opportunities for disabled people and the rights of disabled people. And I know on which side of the balance I come down on. OK, thanks. Moving on then, do you, and, and to both sides of this, one is the private car parking side, but the other is also um, the way councils are approaching the on-street parking and maybe, their, and maybe what they have to put in place in terms of the cost to them. So on the off-street off <laughs> parking, the, the private car parking, I just wondered if you've thought about any unintended consequences and one of the ones that springs to mind is some of the operators that operate in these car parks um, and, and this comes from constituency casework previously are actually issuing fines to dis disabled drivers who perhaps have their badges upside down or have maybe slipped onto the seat they're not on the dashboard so that's one thing that, that maybe has been an unintended consequence for disabled drivers but the second or do you want to talk about that first of all and move on to what the second one might be? Well, you can do them both at the same okay, time, thanks. I'm happy for that. So the, the second one might be to do with councils and I can only um, look at my own area and issues that have been raised with me and the issue is that there's been, you know, I've had a number of um, cases where people have been refused blue badges and we're talking about older folk, like elderly folk with, you know, waiting on hip replacements, they've got osteoarthritis, people with dementia and they're being refused blue badges. And I'm trying to get to the bottom of why this might be the case with cases that I would say obviously should be given blue badges. Um, and I wonder if, is there any unintended consequences of the legislation in that does the issue, you know, if, if more people have blue badges, does that put more costs on the councils under the legislation to then be providing more um, disabled spaces in towns? Um, let, let me deal with the last one first because I too have come across people that you would think would get a blue badge that haven't received one. Um, it is entirely separate legislation um, and the blue badge regulations were I think revised, in fact it might well have been a member's bill, um, but they certainly were revised and different criteria were applied. And actually across Scotland, the, I think there are minimum standards, but, but every local authority interprets it slightly differently. Um, that said, you know, if you create a provision that says you have to have enforceable parking, then it could potentially enter somebody's mind that you don't want to ad administer quite so many blue badges. But I have to say, in my local authority, they're entirely separate departments. So, you know, that crossover in thinking wouldn't happen. So a blue badge would typically be issued by, I think, social work, um, whereas the enforcement and provision of disabled bays um, is a, a matter for the road section. So there are those kind of Chinese walls, whether they're intended or otherwise, that operate. So I haven't picked up locally 
that there has been a consequence of the legislation in terms of the number of, of blue badges because it is um, dealt with separately. In terms of enforcement, um, you, you're absolutely right in the sense that um, we didn't set the standards for enforcement. We simply said whatever regime applies, applies in, in the context of this bill. So if there are enforcement problems already, those enforcement problems will continue. Um, and it is the case that in some you know, retail settings, I've seen enforcement carried out with a degree of vigour um, that probably is about you know, a target for the number of fixed penalty notices you, you issue um, rather than a process of education. And if education fails, then enforcement. Um, so I think that would likely happen in any case. But yes, you're absolutely right. There are occasions where you know, blue badges will fall off the dashboard um, in cases where I know supermarkets administer that, they take the view that they will cancel usually those those items of enforcement because they care about them as customers. It's a very reasonable um, excuse to have and therefore supermarkets exercise that responsibility, I think, quite sensibly. Um, but it is about them having control. Okay. okay. Any other members want to come in at this point? Mr Whiteman? Uh, just to follow up to your um, observations about the larger off-street um, premises where often a customer relationship is doing doing this job anyway, um, but the lack of awareness on smaller uh, off-street premises, um, I think you're not minded to have much sympathy with Edinburgh and Glasgow wanting to get rid of the um, duty to, 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 to engage, but what, could, what, what more could be done to focus on these smaller premises? Um, that are visited presumably just as often, if not more often, than um, larger retail premises by disabled people. Um, you're absolutely right. It is about access to the whole high street. So if you're in, in my area, then the council already provides, in terms of capacity, sufficient disabled bays that are enforceable that you would be able to access most of the shops in, in, in my high street. I think the way to do it isn't necessarily a letter that just gets put to one side because it's not part of somebody's core business, but actually more meaningful engagement. That is time consuming. But there are already lots of access panels that exist across the country who are happy to do this kind of work, who actually um, would welcome the likes of a public awareness campaign that would coincide with some of this. So it wouldn't be beyond us to organise, or the Scottish Government, a public awareness campaign that's backed up then by local authorities, perhaps engaging with the Federation of Small Business, with the Scottish Chambers of Commerce, the networks that exist out there, where they promote to their own members good practice, as well as engaging with individual businesses. But you know, there are, I think, something like a million people in Scotland who identify themselves as in some way disabled. Of that, there's 230,000 blue badge holders at the point I introduced my bill. You know, there's an army of people out there with a pound in their pocket wanting to spend. Businesses understand that. Let's also make them understand the challenges for disabled people in accessing their shops um, that's preventing them from engaging in you know, spending that pound in their premises. And I think you'll find that people do wake up. So it is, for me, an issue of disability rights. But it's also a good business issue, and we should be taking that out to those shops who haven't yet realised that this is for them too. And just a, a, fur a further question. I mean, you, your evidence seems to suggest that the bill has been um, quite successful in achieving its aims, that there's probably no need for any further legislation specifically in relation to the objectives of this bill, but that other activity... Uh -huh like you've just mentioned, like the Transport Minister Stakeholder Group, like perhaps um, some action on signage if and when there's a legislative opportunity. Those could all enhance the objectives of the bill, but the bill itself is um, doing a decent job and, and uh, you're happy that it remains on the statute book for as long as it's needed. I will always bow to this committee's view as to whether the bill needs improvement. Um, but, but yeah, we, we, it was a very tightly defined bill. I was guided at the beginning, and I think it was good advice, that if you try as, a, as an individual member to, to bite off too much, you will not succeed. So we ignored the temptation to do blue badges. We ignored the temptation to do um, parking you know, on, on pavements. 
all of that was placed on our plate and we said, no, we will stick very clearly to a very focused bit of legislation that takes these 85% of all disabled parking bays that were advisory and made them enforceable. Now, the bill doesn't cover enforcement. Um, the perennial problem remains, can we enforce these things? Where are the police when you want them to enforce your disabled parking bay? Um, you know, there are even some uh, debates between people as to whether there are sufficient disabled parking bays and they feel one should be for them. My bill doesn't deal with any of that. Um, the issue for me, and the one I think is worth, is worth thinking through, is the other bits of legislation that would make this work better, whether there's the opportunity, as the convener said, for voluntary codes um, to be adopted, um, but actually for local authorities and others to embrace this, because we can make a transformational change on the ground, and we need to keep pushing at it. It's not just a question of ticking the box and, and moving away. So, of course, the bill should be kept under review. But actually, for me, it's also about implementation. And our history is littered, not just with members' bills, but with other bills, of things that we've passed in statute that haven't quite been implemented on the ground in, in, in the way we would like. So I think keeping that under constant review is something to be welcomed. Thank you. OK, can I ask, Ms Bailey, I was just looking at my notes there and I couldn't actually find the information I was looking for, so my apologies that I don't know the answer to this, but it's my understanding that there's still a number of uh, on-street parking bays that local authorities have yet to make enforceable, uh, and some local authorities may not have started that process as yet. It's a bit, bit, bit it's patchy, is, is, is the it, point I would make. My, my understanding is most of them have done it, Okay, so, so typically what we ask them to do is go and look at, survey all the advisory bays you have, identify whether they're still needed, um, if they're still needed, um, promote one traffic regulation order to actually make them all enforceable. Now, annual reports are produced, um, and so we should be able to track progress. Um, some of them have moved at different speeds to others. I certainly know Glasgow identified and had a, a list of all their advisory bays quite early on. Other areas didn't even begin to have a list and would physically require to go out and, and look. Um, so that was the first stage of the process. Um, but the majority, I think, have, and the process that most engage in now is if there is a new application for a disabled bay, then what would happen is they would get an advisory bay whilst they were waiting for the traffic regulation order um, to be taken forward. So the bulk should be covered. But, I mean, I'm happy to, like you, search for the information and bring that back to the committee. Apologies, because we should have had it in front of us here and I, I, couldn't, I couldn't find okay. it. But I, I suppose what I would ask then, if there's any local authorities with any long-standing, and this may not be the case, but any long-standing advisory base that have yet to be subject to a TRO, that would be unacceptable and it would be a priority Absolutely. to get those enforceable as soon as possible. Eight years on, that's frankly yeah. completely unacceptable. Yeah. And, and let, let's not set that here running, but I, I thought there yeah. anecdotally that, that, that could be the case. But any new bays, that whole issue about an advisory bay and then a TRO, you would agree changing the, the regulations so that a TRO is just not required to make a bay enforceable and that, and that can be done. If that's possible to do, then that, that would make it much easier. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Uh, members, any other questions at, at this point? Okay. Uh, we seem to be all out of questions, Ms Bailey. Any opportunity you wish to make any final comments would be would be most welcome. No, can I thank the convener and the committee for their courtesy today? Um, and I hope you do improve the bill or at least get the Scottish Government um, to help with some of the implementation of it. Well, uh, all there is to say is thank you once again for, for attending and we will, Mr Stewart's already thinking about possible recommendations in, in relation to the evidence we've heard, but we will, we will certainly consider it and uh, certainly contact the Scottish Government uh, in relation to any ways the bill could be, could be let's say, enhanced rather than improved, Miss Bailey. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. That ends Agenda Item 3 and we now move into private session for Agenda Item 4. Thank you.